Uh, I have, over the past three or four months, I've uh, I kind of waited a year or two to let the framework, uh, the next generation framework of JavaScript kind of settle. Um, I don't know why I thought it would ever settle. It's always going to be a, a battle. But uh, I kind of just didn't study Angular or Ember until um, a while. And so about three or four months ago, I was like, OK, I finally should start looking at things. Um, so I built something in Angular, then I built something in Ember. Um, then I kind of decided I like Angular, so I went back to Angular. Um, and then uh, about a year ago, uh, or less than a year ago, ReactJS came out from Facebook. Um, and this is the one that really resonated, has resonated with me the most. Um, so there's a little Ember Angular bashing here, but it's all good fun. Um, and because I know Angular is really popular, um, so yeah, React is used um, used by Facebook. It's in their production system. It's also used by Instagram. Uh, there's a couple seats over here. Um, so it's uh, yeah, it's it's another library from from one of the big boys. So what is React? Um, it's a framework for, it's, it's really a, not even a framework, it's really a, a library for building user interfaces. And that's, that's the tagline that I have in the web. Um, and what that really means is, is it's really just concerned about the view layer. So if you're going to talk about MVC or K or J or whatever, uh, if models of using controllers, um, I guess the, the, the best way to, to put it is that it's just a view layer. And I know that Tim said that the same thing about Knockout. But I think it's true. Basically concerned with presenting some data onto your onto the web, onto your application, which is your user interface. So it takes care of all of the hard stuff for, for dealing with that. It turns out that there's a lot of stuff that's just really hard dealing with user interfaces. Um, so it has no opinion of, of how you model, model your data. It has no, no opinion about the architecture of your app, um, which means you can really integrate it with, all, with existing architectures, which means you can uh, easily, slowly integrate it. Um, and it means that uh, there's even people who have integrated it with uh, Backbone, so they use Backbone models and the Backbone stuff, but, they, but instead of having the Backbone render function, they hook into uh, React. So I'm just kind of setting the stage. It's a very focused library that focuses on one thing, and it does it really, really well in a, in a really interesting way. So one of the driving decisions about React um, is that you should use components instead of templates. It really actually, um, it's, it's interesting because uh, Facebook came out with React uh, JS Conf last May in 2013. Um, I think that's what it was, uh, and they presented it in a way that they actually focused on all the wrong things about React, in my opinion. Um, and it was kind of not, it wasn't very well received. And I was actually at that JS Conf, and I was like, "What? What is this even going on?" Um, but I think uh, since then they've really explained what they're doing, and it's a really, and it's, I, I think it's a good idea. Um, so I think you, you just give it. Uh, a few minutes because in some ways, uh, if you initially look at it, um, some some of the best practices that you're used to um, might feel like this is going against those. Uh, but I'm going to make an argument why that's a good thing. Um, so let's let's start with uh, templates. Um, so this is how we used to make websites, right? In the in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, we used PHP, uh, we just happily uh, just strung code everywhere and HTML. It, these weird less than dollar sign things to switch to switch languages and it was just it was terrible. Um, um, so like I'm not only just generating a, a user interface by using raw PHP, but I'm actually querying MySQL. And that actually wasn't surprisingly unfortunately not that uncommon. Um, so we learned from that. We learned that there's this thing of separation of concerns. Um, so this is what we thought was separation of concerns was that you have this thing called a controller. Um, which that is where you stick all your PHP code or your whatever language code, um, and you have templates which are big files of HTML, and the controller sends data to the template and they render that template. So the template isn't really HTML; it's usually something like this. Um, this is you know it can be J uh, Django or Jinja or whatever one of those template systems where you basically it, kind of, it basically looks like HTML, but you have these constructs like the for the for each which iterates over um, an array and generates uh, HTML based on the data that you pass to it. So if you, if you render the template with an array of items, it will generate several of the LIs um, in that first UL block. It will, it will generate, if there's 10, 10 items, um, it will generate 10 LIs there. And there's other things like if there's if, um, if blocks, those are just kind of the standard things that you use to the templates. So because we separated out templates from the core language, we've had to come up with this whole other different templating language, and we've had to do all these other things to go around the fact that we're now not in our original language. We're using these templates. We thought that this was good for separation of concerns, 
And it, it, it was okay for sites that are separated into pages, and that's how we were still doing stuff in the mid-2000s or so. That was before we really started integrating into single-page apps, which is the, what the web is moving to right now. As you move into single-page apps, you start realizing a few things that this is a broken model. So if we look at this page, we, um, if you look at this in a component, um, instead of just one large template that takes some data, there's really, uh, you actually see several different components. So you have a header component. Um, so the, the red boxes are each, each component. There's a header component, a list component, um, a, and a panel component. And then the green box highlights like uh, a, a subcomponent, um, which is just a list of options. It's kind of a trivial example. But as you look at this page with this large template, which is kind of how a lot of us are doing things right now, you start seeing that there's all these individual components that have their own concerns. It doesn't really make sense to stick all of these into one large template. Um, and as you start building single page apps, this gets really painful because uh, you want to be, instead of just moving a page across pages, which that's what made this uh, relatively work, um, you start wanting to update just pieces of the page. And so you have start having to add more and more stuff to your templating engine to figure out which pieces of the page to update. So uh, there's really, in um, the typical use case of doing this is that you have, uh, like Angular has, a, has an ng controller directive that, that you stick on um, various DOM, DOM nodes which specify the controller controls this, this small piece of the page. Um, Ember actually does, I, personally I think, a, a better architecture and actually forces you, every single component and every single view has a separate template. So there's this one long list of small templates, which I think is what I'm going to get to soon. Um, so as you start building single page apps, that structure of building small, many small templates um, that are separate from each other is a better way. Um, now, because you have uh, a bunch of controllers and a bunch of small templates, so these are a bunch of controllers are connected to the templates, it turns out that there's, there's actually a lot of implicit dependencies between these templates and controllers. Um, so when you have a controller, you usually query a database and then you get some data, and then you render the template with that data. Uh, the template that you're rendering is very explicitly dependent on, or, or it's actually more implicitly dependent on the, the data that you're passing to it. So the controller knows everything about the template. It knows exactly which items to construct to give to the template, because it knows which items <coughs> are in the template. The template also knows everything about the items. It knows exactly what is passed to it. And as in the real world case, we've realized that there's just a lot of implicit dependencies that end up coming up between these uh, controllers and templates. So we thought that this was a separation of concerns and it kind of worked for, for apps that were across pages that you migrate page to page. But as we're moving more towards the single page apps, which is where the web is going, uh, this implicit dependency uh, model where we have separate templates and separate controllers really just pro provide a ton of complexity for really not much gain. Um, for example, if you're rendering a, uh, a a template, um, you know, you'll you'll start doing things like this uh, for various reasons. Be, either be the lack of expressiveness in, in the templating language, or because you just have to calculate something complex in the JavaScript side. But you'll you'll render a model that has uh, properties of name and height. Um, but you'll have to calculate something like uh, should highlight this model. So you're passing something explicitly about the display nature of this into the template. And you'll, you'll see this more and more as your app gets more and more complex. Um, so there's just implicit dependencies here between the template and, and the controller. <coughs> I think the, uh, the worst cases that you start seeing as uh, cracks come out are in places like Angular where you have a directive. Um, so directives in Angular to me are the most modular way, way to do things, and that's why people love directives. But when you start getting into complex directives, you start having to write templates for the directive. And guess what the template is? It's just a string. I mean, we're basically going all the way back to the backbone method where you're having to construct strings within templates. Um, to me, it's just bizarre um, why we're, con we're like pulling away the template, but there's all these things that we're having to add back to it because we've separated the templates and, and the controllers. Um, so really, templates are a distraction, and uh, templates and views and controllers are inherently technical people. Um, so by expressing our apps this way, we, uh, or sorry, by expressing our apps uh, like this, we end up uh, having to hack in a bunch of other stuff, like directives and, uh, and all of these other things that are a little bit weird to make up for the fact that we're not just in our original language and that we're not generating markup with our controller. 
And that, that's the thing that kind of goes against the best practice. Uh, but as we're moving, we've, we've moved from a specific kind of app, which was going from page to page, <coughs> into this sing singular app, which has really complex user interfaces. Uh, it deserves, our best practices deserve to be rethought. We shouldn't just inherit things that we think are good. So this is a, just to get a little bit more concrete, this is a, this is a React code. This is a fully functional usage of the React library. So it, it just shows how minimal and how easy to use it is. So you create a component with React.create class, um, and then you render it with React.render component. So typically, uh, typically you have an app, an app uh, React component, which is your, your, your thing that controls everything and then you just render your app into document.body and then your app composes all these other components. So you don't really have to call React at render components several times, you just call React render component your app and then your app just does, does everything. But this is just a small component called hello. Um, and what it does is it uh, takes the render component call, constructs hello as if it kind of were a native DOM tag um, and it renders that into document.body, so it appends it. And you'll see when we um, create the hello uh, component, we pass um, a name of world to it. And that's kind of like in, the, in HTML, you have attributes. Uh, name is an attribute. But what's cool about React is that because we're all in JavaScript, attributes can be any type. Uh, whereas in, um, in the HTML world, it's harder to pass around data because attributes are pretty much only strings. Um, so name could be anything, name could be a full array, um, but name becomes a property on our hello component instance. Um, so the only thing required of a React component is the implementation of the render function, and what the render function does is it returns the, the React DOM, which that's what you see when I say, when I create the react.dom.div. Um, so the first argument to the, the DOM constructor functions are a list of attributes, so I don't have any, so I just pass null, and then it passes in the content, which is, uh, it concatenates hello with the, the, the name that it passed into, which is available at this up props. So this up props is all the properties of the component. So it looks a little bit weird. Some people react, like, bizarrely to this because they think it's weird that we're constructing DOM within our JavaScript. We're using JavaScript as our DOM representation. And there, there are sl um, slimmer ways to construct the DOM. Like, within JavaScript, you don't always have to do react.dom.div. Uh, there's a few different methods to make it even more terse, to make it look more like an actual DOM. Um, but this way, we're, we're back in JavaScript. We're creating our, our flows of user interfaces in JavaScript. We don't have to bizarrely do this weird templating language and add in all these things to call back to JavaScript. Uh, I'll get into more later. I'll show you the demos where we're, this just has a crazy amount of power because we can just, uh, instead of having just for each, now we can do some kind of crazy filter function which calls, which checks, uh, filters out specific uh, properties and renders those instead of having to do that beforehand and then pass it to a uh, template and then do each. Uh, it's just it's a lot easier to, to uh, do it this way. Um, so this is this is why it's. Can you say what were those two parameters going in? You said one is the attributes that will get rendered. One is the um, the attributes basically, like properties. I guess properties is a better name. Like it, like in a. It, in an HTML DOM tag, you have like, um, you know, href equals string. Um, that's where you could pass here if you like. I'll show. I'll, I'll show you in the. So that's like an object and an href property. Yes, it's an and object. The URL would be the, the value for that. Property. Yes, it's a hash. It's a JavaScript hash. Ah, okay. So I just passed null because I, I probably should pass something in there to show you that you can do like uh, curly brace, curly brace class name and then the class that the div is going to have when it actually renders it to the document. Um, there is, there's not really defaults per se. I mean, whatever defaults there are, they're going to be the HTML5 defaults to whatever is there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, but there, um, I'll get into more, more complicated examples later. I just wanted to give some meat early on, so I'm not just waxing philosophically. <laughs> um, so this is um. This is something I'm going to just mention. Um, this is the thing that they put, that Facebook focused on when they first announced React. Um, there's, they come up with, a, with an extension to JavaScript called JSX. Um, if you if you look at React on the home page, I think you'll see this instead of the other one. Um, and they basically came up with a way to match um, to embed HTML fragments into the JavaScript language itself. 
So JSX is just a transformer. It takes this code right here, which has an H1 that's embedded right in JavaScript, and it transforms it into the DOM call that I showed you before. So this is creating the H1 without any attributes, and it has the hello world as the content. Um, so this turns into that. That's it's a very straightforward transform that the JSX does, and this is nice when you really have to be working with design with um, designers or people like that that don't really want to do the crazy uh, JavaScript things and are more more used to just writing normal HTML. Um, you could use something like JSX to actually get back some of the HTML syntax. Um, personally, I don't think you should really use this because I think that you're getting into the weird world of mixing syntaxes and then you have to get into the syntax highlighting. Um, I like this more and that there are a few ways that you can simplify this even more so that you're not always having to pass no. Hey, can uh, I ask a question about that? Sure. Uh, so you kind of need the JSX if you want to work with the designer, right? Um, yes. Otherwise, it's gonna be, they're not going to be able to write that thing. They're not going to be able to write this. No, I mean, that's that's one that's one thing that's good for. If, if you wanted to use it, it's fine. Okay. Um, and um, in the previous slide, do you know the idea behind why not just take in a JSON and then why do you need to write like the React that done that the what can you just what can I just pass in the JSON like you know HTML is JSON just send it in isn't that that's really what it is right it's yeah I mean it's just they chose to do it uh, this representation instead of a JSON you could return a JSON and then uh, so you're right I think you could just process it differently but it's just going to be different syntax. I think the JSON would actually be a little bit worse because you'd have to do uh, curly bracket and then like type colon string div and then it, and then like children property and then a bunch of children. So what 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 you can't see here is instead of in the content contents of the dim the div the div that says hello plus the name uh, you could have um, in like another component and then you could have a whole list of components as more arguments to the DOM constructor. Um, so with the JSON, you have to have like a children property, and it's just even more verbose. So you don't want to lose. You want to be a little bit nice for even JavaScript developers um, that aren't using JSX. So that's somewhat nice. So I, I'm I'm big on the SweetJS macros. I don't know if it, um, any of you all know of that project. Um, so we're working on macros to actually make it look more even better than this, um, so that you can actually just do div parentheses and then just stuff inside of it. You don't have to do react dot dom div. Um, but yeah, I mean, you you could totally do that too. You could probably write something if you really wanted to do that that converts it into this. And and uh, I, you said I can pass in, I can attach event handlers right here. Yep. Yeah. So that's that's something that I'll get into later because that's a very important part of, of it too. Um, so you could do like on change or on on click and call a JavaScript function. Um, so. I showed you how how you express components, um, but now now let's get into why React is so uh, so different um, and so good. Um, the whole the the biggest movement in the recent years of JavaScript frameworks is data binding, and basically what that means is when you change a uh, some of your data in JavaScript, you want the user interface that's representing that data to change automatically. Uh, we we had years of pain where whenever we changed something, we had to you know use jQuery to like query the DOM element that we wanted to change and like change the property that represented that uh, data change and make sure make manually change the DOM basically to make sure that it's representing the the change of the, the JavaScript app state um, and that got so painful that uh, people have been doing some really cool ways to make it automatic. Uh, for example, uh, in Ember, I guess I just go ahead and show you Ember. So in Ember, um, Ember is, uh, I'm just going to, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but um, there's, there's a whole lot of different ways to do it because JavaScript doesn't have a way to natively uh, notify you when some kind of data changes. And even if that was there, I don't really think that's the right way, way to do it. Uh, but you basically need to figure out some way where is, if you have an array of items, you push an item onto that array. You want the, the list, the li that are on the pages, or the, the ul that's on the page, to automatically append a number to li. Um, that's kind of the whole the whole thing about this. You don't want to have to manually do that. So you need to figure out how to get notified when something changed and what changed. So Ember, the way that they do it is they have their own model class, and you have to use 
you have to use the, the, that model class for them that is tied specifically to their whole system of, of, of templating. And the model class provides ways to model your data and, provide, and specify fields and things like that. Um, and the model class is whenever you change a property on your model class, you call dot set. So you don't do model dot name equals James. You say model dot set uh, name to James. And this is this is kind of similar to the knockout method, where um, because you're changing data always through one of their native functions, they always know when something changed. Um, so, but what's hard about this is that when you have things like um, a property that depends on other properties. Uh, you you want you want to make sure that that property changes as well. So the trip it's an extremely trivial example, but if you have a first name and a last name field, and then you have a name field that is the first name plus last name, um, you want to make sure that when first name changes, that the view that's uh, wherever just the full name change, uh, is rendered, that that changes as well. So um, the frameworks that do this this model came up with something called computed properties. And basically what that means is you specify in the system that the name property depends on first name and last name. And so there's this manual dependency chain. You have, you have to manually hook up your whole chain of dependency in, um, of, of the data, uh, which some, some people really like that level of control, but it gets really, it gets really repetitive over time. Um, and I don't, I don't think it really scales because it can, things can go wrong and it's hard to figure out what's going on and why, why something didn't update. Uh, but when you, since you told the system explicitly how your whole user interface is dependent, then when a piece of data changes, it knows that whole dependency chain and it can walk through an update DOM. So whenever you call it .set, it re-renders whatever is depending on that property. Um, and because it is connected to its own templating system, it knows exactly the DOM nodes that are representing the properties that, it, that you rendered with the template. And it just goes in and knows exactly exactly the DOM node to change. So it just changes changes the DOM node with a new value. So that, that's how that's how Ember works. Angular is a much different uh, is a much different uh, architecture. Uh, so the problem with um, Ember is that you have to use a model class, right? So you have to model using data uh, within the model class that you can call the dot set on it. Well Angular lets you just use raw object objects and you can attach anything you want to to a scope and um, and templates are rendered with that scope. And it magically is able to get this working by, call, by using something called dirty checking. Um, so basically, whenever you run code when you're using Angular, it has to be run inside of their scope apply. So it basically has to, you, you can never just run code yourself. You have to pass it off to Angular, and it will call back into you, and you do your thing. So that way, Angular always knows when, when code has been run. That's all it knows, is something has, something has been run, and that most likely means something has changed. And the way it figures out what has changed is it keeps a copy of all of your data, and then it gets um, after your code has been run, it it does a, a check to see for all for all of the data that he has or she. Um, let's check with the copy that we have of their data and see what has changed. And then they figure out the specific properties that have changed. Um, and then uh, I think I'm not extremely familiar with it, but I think they just know can infer which. Uh, properties change on the scope, and therefore they can figure out which DOM elements to update with, with the scopes. Um, so they basically let you do whatever you want to. You can change whatever JavaScript object you want to, and then it just checks checks with all these dirty checks, and then it figures out what's changed some magical way, and then it knows how to, how to re-render it. So I'm, I'm kind of talking out of my, out of my butt, because um, <laughs> I just know it works some, some, some way like that. But it's, it's neat because there's an automatic automatic change, right? So you, with, when something is dependent on something else, because the whole thing is rechecked again, um, you don't have to, it, those dependencies are automatically figured out when, when something has changed. Um, because it knows in the template that you, that you did something. Um, I still think it's a little bit weird. There's, there's some hacks that you have to do to make sure some things are updated. And the worst part about it is that everything has to be running from within Angular. So you can't use like a, your own promise library. Using a promise library, whenever you get a callback in the promise, you have to make sure you call this uh, scope.apply function so that it's run within Angular's framework. If you run something outside of outside Angular's frameworks and you change something, it's not going to be synced to the user interface. So it's really easy to forget to call scope apply and have something not change. And so you have to wrap everything up in one of their services. And it just it just I think it's I think it's the wrong cross-section of technologies and they're 
and they're, and they're required to come up with all, all of these new things to make up for the fact that there's all these other things going on. So React, uh, it's really simple. You just change some state, and then you just re-render the whole freaking thing. That, that's as simple as it is. Um, and that's the intuitive part about what is crazy and why it works so well. So everything is automatically uh, figured out in terms of the dependency chain, and it, it doesn't care really how or what has changed. It just re-renders your whole app. So what do you think that means? Why, what does it mean to re-render the lab? Does it mean that it creates a whole nother, if you have an app as a top level component then all these other subcomponents, does it re-render your whole HTML structure and just like set it as inner HTML? Um, no, I mean, that would, that'd be, that's the dominant incredibly way to slow for that. So there's, there's something that it does. Um, so um, let's see, I'm going to come back to that. The way that it does it is that it treats the DOM as just a rendering layer and it has something called a virtual DOM. So because we're creating um, all of those, that DOM structure um, in, in JavaScript, those are all the React virtual DOM elements. Those aren't real DOM, DOM, DOM elements. And because it's all a virtual DOM, what React can do is it treats this as a very lightweight DOM. So it just it has this nested tree structure of, of DOM that, does, that represents your tags and, and your, and your uh, properties and things like that. Um, and so it's, very, it's a very lightweight, it's just a bunch of JavaScript objects. That's pretty much it. And then it has a, a, um, a very cool algorithm to, to diff the virtual DOM and know which changes to apply. So I'll get into that later. So one of the, the, the things that um, is driving this whole architecture is that UIs are just really hard. You saw that with the previous frameworks, there is dependencies between UI um, user interface elements. Um, and those dependencies become really complicated. Um, there's a lot of small bits of state going on all around it in your user, user interface. Um, and it's just all interconnected and it's a complex, complex thing to figure out how to express in a sane way. Because um, when you have a lot of small things changing going on all over the place, it's hard to, to grasp in your head and hard to, to model what's going on in your head. Um, so if you have a bunch of different components, just for example, a little bit more concrete, um, and they're all different JavaScript objects, and they all, when you click a button, it changes these other three things, which change four other things. They're all JavaScript objects, and they're all changing properties within their own JavaScript objects, and they're just setting you know, the raw JavaScript properties on themselves. There's all these little JavaScript properties changing everywhere. Your app state is littered across your, your UI, whatever JavaScript objects that you're using. And it's really hard to, to, to think about. It's really hard to test. It's really hard to make sure that at this certain point in your app, when you press a button, that this other thing changes, because you, you just have to really manually make sure everything is good. So one of React's core principles is to make everything explicit. Um, let's, let's bottle up everything into the right components and um, make sure that um, we're letting you allow, allowing you to express your app in a way that uh, makes sense. It's not templates and controllers and all these things that are split across half that shouldn't be split and make you do all these uh, different things. The better way to look at it is that you have a whole bottle of your app state. And your app state is just could be one big JavaScript object with a ton of different properties. And this isn't even just models. This is just like, you know, the current counter or the current highlighted color of the button or something like that. You have this one big thing that's a state. And then when you apply it to a component, which could be, for example, your app component, your top level component, it renders out your whole app and then you have your output. So it's a very nice way to treat your, your app and your user interface because it's very easy to keep track of changes. Um, you don't, um, React enables you to do things in much more like each component can have local state. Um, and that's just for usability and some, some other reasons. But there's this whole movement to, to kind of push everything into just one big local state object. And then you apply it to your, your top level node and it re-renders everything. Um, and what's neat about it is that you can just tweak your state and then you can re-render your app and then you can dip it and see what's changed. Um, and I'll show, you, I'll show you why that's really neat. So basically, um, you, have, uh, one, you have a piece of state and then you have your component and then you, when you apply it, you get output. When you change the state, you apply it to the same component and you get different output. What React does is it takes those two outputs which, is, which are the virtual DOM, and it diffs them. So it subtracts the, uh, the previous output to your current one, and it gets the list of changes of what's changed. And then it applies that diff to the real DOM. So that's how it's able to uh, actually update the real DOM, and why it treats the, end, uh, treats the browser as just a rendering la layer. Um, and this way you can change state however you like, re-render your whole app, 
it dips it and gets just the minimal set of changes, and it changes the DOM there. For that reason, it's really fast because it's only making the minimal number of DOM changes. And you're really able to express your UI in a very clear way without having to manage all of these other weird tran transclusion and stuff like that. Um, hey, hey, can I ask a question? Sure. Sorry. Uh, so the, uh, the virtual DOM, it's dipping it against another virtual DOM, the previous state, yep. and not the DOM itself? Yes, exactly. Okay, so yes. you have two virtual DOMs at some point, so yes. that it can do the diffs. Okay. Yes. And, and like you had mentioned, if you have an application state that's global, it's, let's say that's sitting in the window, right? Is, is that a good practice if, you're, if you have a lot of views in your app? Uh, anything changes, it's going to try and dip the whole tree. Or isn't it better to, you know, make the you know, state smaller for each view has its own state, and then somehow, you know, roll it back up into a global state instead of not having. There is, um, I mean, it's. I would say by default, try just try it out. Try try a global state because I think there are a lot of really interesting things that you end up being able to do. There's some guys that are um, in the Glitter Script world. Uh, David Nolan came up with a framework called Ohm, and he. Um, that what they what they really showed and proved was that when you have your one global app state object, uh, you can do things like undos, like totally trivially, because all you got to do is keep the reference to the last app state. And they actually update it. Uh, they don't change. It's persistent. So when it updates, they get a new tree. And so they just keep a list of a hundred of the previous DOMs, and it's a shared structure, so it's not. It's pretty efficient. And then you, to do an undo, you just apply the previous app state and it works. So it's there are real good benefits to doing that. But uh, you're absolutely you're absolutely right that there's real world like needs there like he, here and there where you you should do some local app state. It's either performance reasons or you don't want to muddle up something else where there's a conflict with something else. It's just kind of kind of that's something that you just need to figure out as you're developing your app. Uh, should it belong in the local component or should it belong in the global app state? Uh, it's both are valid. I'm not saying that you should choose one, one or the other. And, and uh, when does the triggering of the diffing and re-rendering, you know, should that be cognizant of that div? Um, like, you know, I, I don't want to just try re-rendering my entire app on text change of a text box, right? Um, no, you you can. That's what they've, that's what they've shown. Um, I was okay. going to show a video, but I don't really have the audio. Um, some of the, the React guys that have really shown you that JavaScript engines are even on mobile, even on Safari, the unjitted version of JavaScript, it's fast. You don't have to worry about it. It's okay. even with the largest app possible, it's like under 16 milliseconds. I mean, just the whole the whole idea is just don't worry about it. And there there is so you you do bring up a good point too because there are cases where you actually do need to worry about it. Um, and what's so great is that React um, gives you a way to optimize that. So it, um, there is a way to tell React uh, when when this thing changes. Uh, don't worry about the rest of this tree. Just just focus on my part and dip this part. Um, but is there a way to throttle it? Because if I change, let's say I'm showing, showing let's say mouse coordinates, right? As I'm, when I'm moving my mouse, I don't want that going crazy when I'm moving my mouse, right? So is there a way to throttle that? Again? It's it's automatically batched. Um, so okay. but there is a there there is a stronger way to throttle it if you really want to take control of it, which I'll show in the demos. Though there is a cool way to. Um, Control when, how often it dips and when it dips and stuff like that. So I'll get into that a little bit more. So um, it turns out to be really fast to do everything in JavaScript, um, and it's really simple for your for you. You you get a ton of stuff for free, um, and just like he was mentioning, it's really easy to batch updates. So another problem with some of the other systems are when you make a change, uh, it fires off a change. Uh, which goes and figures out what to change and updates the DOM. Uh, they have to do a bunch of work to make sure that if you, in the same block of JavaScript, if you change a couple properties, to uh, only all just make one big update to the DOM. And Ember has like a run loop, and it's 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 a pretty uh, it's a pretty sophisticated, elegant way to solve that problem. And Angular does something else. Um, but there is a this is really easily patchable because um, you just let the user make changes, and then uh, you. There's by default certain ways that it triggers off that the data has changed, but if you want more control over that, you can actually control how, how much it patches. Um, it's really easy to manually out. 
optimize, um, there's a method on each component called shift component update, and that basically gives you the control to tell React to uh, that my, my component hasn't changed. So instead of making it diff the whole tree, you can actually selectively optimize afterwards how, how the diffing process kind of occurs. And you can, you know, you can kind of learn that, learn more about that later. I don't know if you're going to share this, but what's the type you guys you know working on a lot of your application, you've got a shared global object, and you're working with other people doing things like optimizing for you want to say, I'll render just on this, uh, in this instance. Um, how do you coordinate with our developers? Um, I'll just repeat the question. But uh, he was asking if you're working with other, other developers and you have like a global app state um, and you wanted to optimize the rendering, how do you kind of coordinate? Um, well, first of all, the, the global app state is something that um, I, it's not something that you should necessarily do. Like, I think it's okay to have local component app state if you if it really is something that might conflict with other people. I can't I can't give you this is something that's more of a feeling, and I'm I'm still learning React at this level too. Like, I'm not exactly sure to give you some good guidelines about that. Um, all I know is if you keep something in, in one just big big global object, um, that there are some really good benefits to that. Um, and you, the, the other point I'd make is really you shouldn't really you shouldn't have to be concerned about the optimizations. That is a very very rare uh, that's a very rare case where you'd actually have to op optimize it. Where you might have a list of like a thousand or like ten thousand items, and the list renders really really complex objects. You could implement each uh, the each object each component that is each object in the list. You could you could optimize that and. There's really no reason why that should conflict with anybody else. Um, it's after you've built out the whole app, you can selectively optimize what you want to a little bit. What about the batch? The batching just just happens automatically for you. So when when um, I'll get into that in just a little bit. Um, so it's it's also testable because we're divorced from the DOM. We can render a whole virtual DOM to us into a stream. Um, and each component has various methods that we can call, and we can mock out the, the DOM creation and various ways to do it. Um, it's very testable because you can just test every single component now. Every component is all in JavaScript, and it's all using this virtual DOM. So you can run it on Node.js you know, really easily, and just uh, if you wanted to, one, one way of testing is just to give, it, give a, a state to a component and render it, and then just make sure that um, the string is the same. And that means if you change some internal stuff, if the string isn't the same, then it's not creating the right DOM. Um, so it's really, really easily testable. Uh, it's easily renderable on a server because it's this virtual DOM again. Um, you don't have to fire up PhantomJS and you know, do all this crazy stuff because it doesn't use the DOM at all. Um, you can actually render out the whole initial state of the app, and the user will see it immediately. And then uh, there's a way to, to connect React to it all with an already rendered DOM. Um, so we already talked about this a little bit, but this um, a render is triggered by default with a button called set state. So every component has a has a method called set state, which takes a JavaScript object, which uh, the keys are which properties to change and values are what property what what to change them to. So if you, for example, the batching, uh, if you call set state multiple times in one like one pass of the event loop, um, it's going to only trigger the rendering once. So that's that's automatically batched. Um, so you, there's really, I don't see any reason why uh, if multiple components are being created by different people and they're becoming dependent on each other, uh, it's it's just going to call, it's just going to do the re-rendering once every so often, um, every time, not not every single set state. Okay, how does it handle things like, let's say I got a calendar component, you know, when I it expands out and I affect that changes the state, but I need the calendar component to stay up, right? So the user can still see it. But when the app gets re-rendered, that's going to go away, right? Um, it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't go away. I mean, whatever, it's only going to change what should be changed. Um, so there is... Because it changes now the data in that calendar text box or whatever, that actually changed. So that's going to try and change that, re-render that thing. Re-rendering that text box is now going to hide the... The calendar. Why would it make the calendar hide? Like the calendar exists as a DOM element on the page right now. It's just going to update the input. But but it doesn't exist on the virtual. Well, 
it, yeah, it has to exist on the virtual phone. So you're talking about so you're you're talking about something which I'll get into way way later. Um, and I thought somebody was going to ask this. Basically, if you if you integrated it with like a jQuery calendar widget, um, there are ways to uh, as with any framework, you would need to uh, kind of. Well, the, the best way to do it would be to wrap it into its own React component, like a calendar, and then there are various ways to integrate external libraries. Um, but you could just even do it on the mobile app thing. You could, there are certain methods you can capture. Um, but it's, you can, uh, I'm not exactly sure how to answer your, your question, but there, there are ways to integrate with third-party libraries that if they are behaving badly, then that's just, there might be some problems with, um, Integrating with third party stuff, usually the third party stuff works pretty well. So, could you wrap it in a closure since it's a library and then feed the other libraries in through parameters through the closure and integrate it that way? That's why I use it knockout and in integrating in other libraries. It's not, um, I'll, I'll get into that in my demos. Okay. Yeah, I'll be no, it's fine. Yeah, so. Uh, uh, when I heard you say re-rendering, I'm a little confused. So the, the call the re-render event, it, did you just say, does it kind of selectively go through sort of element by element, say if this element has changed, I'm going to be the equivalent of a jQuery, rewrite the HTML with the tags, the attributes? Or does it basically just re-render the entire page? It, so the that's, entire DOM. the virtual DOM is what it's, when I say rendered, um, it's probably overloaded. Um, sometimes I'm in virtual DOM, sometimes I'm in DOM. So here I'm talking about virtual DOM. So when it's when you call set state and you call it multiple times and it's batched up, um, it will call a re-render of the whole of the whole thing, and that will just create the new, the new virtual DOM. And that's just creating JavaScript objects. It's just creating a tree, like an, a JavaScript object that represents a div with some children that are you know divs and a's and all these other stuff. It doesn't have to do any. It doesn't have to know anything more about that. Um, I mean, I think it does some internal tracking. It knows, um, it diffs that from the previous DOM. So it figures out what has changed. So if all you've done is updated an anchor, like an href on an anchor, um, it, will, it will re render the whole thing, but it will diff the previous uh, virtual DOM and just know that, oh, there is just the href property on this anchor that's changed. I'm going to go and just change that property in the actual DOM. So it's when you say it re renders the whole thing. That's not the what's being displayed in the browser. That's just yeah, some yeah. object in memory. Yeah, that's the virtual DOM. Because the obvious question is, and I don't know if this is what you're getting to, if I'm doing an email application in JavaScript, and I have what would be a, a huge text area where I'm typing email, and I have another component that's uh, an alert, say a Yahoo mail. If if that alert comes in, it triggers an entire DOM re-rendering. I don't want to lose my entire email no, typing. No. It won't at all. You'll, um, it'll just know that the alert was added to the page, and it will just add that alert to the DOM place. But, uh, but at some point, it does read under, like, let's say I'm typing in a text box, right? That is changing, that could be changing my application state. Mm -hmm. That's so a, that, since that is changing my application state, it has to read under it. It's got to remove that text box out of the DOM and then put it back in. So at some point, it, I don't know how you, you, you were saying it does a difference between two virtual DOMs. It knows what to change. So is it just blindly deleting that element, that text box element, and just putting the new one in? If the text box has changed, I'm not sure exactly at the internals if it, if like, if you're saying if only property changes, if it blindly blows away the whole thing. Um, I think, I, I'm not sure exactly how it injects the element. All, all I know is that if you have an input element, so, so forms are a whole different thing. I mean, there are specific things that you work with forms, um, but one, one thing I'll say is uh, <coughs> disregarding their whole form binding stuff. If you have an L a component that outputs some big text area um, and it doesn't have any values or anything associated, like you're just inputting a text area and you're typing stuff, some stuff in, if it, the whole thing re-renders again, um, in the virtual DOM, it's not going to have your input that you type into it. It's going to think like nothing has, if you don't actually change anything in the React component on that text area component, it's going to say, oh, it's exactly the same, nothing's changed, it's not going to touch the DOM. But um, with that to say, so you you could be typing stuff in that aren't connected to your app state at all, you could just be typing in some text. What you, what you really should be doing is um, what he said, which is very true. You should, uh, there's a whole, uh, um, I'm not sure, there's a whole technique for 
as, when you press a key press, when there's a change on the input, you do actually call back into React and you change the app state. Because what is in your input is actually part of the app state. It's something that changes over time. So as you're typing, it is updating the app state. So in that way, you are rendering the input with the, like, say it's, um, you know, input value is your, is your app state property. You're rendering the input with input value. And then when it changes, it does update the input value on your app state, re-renders the form with input value as the thing, and then it, um, I'm not sure how it resolves that, but it does see that it's changed and it re-renders it with your new value. So technically every single time you, take, you press a character, it's re-rendering that input. Um, but it's completely seamless to how it doesn't look like it's actually re-rendering it at all. Not sure exactly like the internals of literally how it inject stuff into the DOM, um, but it does it very, very smoothly so that it doesn't actually seem like it is. Um, so, yeah, I thought that that would take a little while. Um, the demo, let's just go into demos. I mean, I don't want to just sit here and talk, because um, I think this will get too far. If you're talking about rendering, uh, you know, the virtual DOMs and so forth, how many virtual DOMs will it create? Only two, like, you know, previous and current? Or is it going to keep stacking them? Um, it will. Let's see. Um, it will only create. It won't keep stacking up. Um, if you want to stack up, you you could implement that without much work to do like an undo. Uh, but no, it it will just create two virtual DOMs okay. at one point. Um, yeah. Um, my head's a little fuzzy right now, but that's no. It's it's in general. Uh, however, it works. It's a pretty it's a pretty efficient system. Um, See, I'll, I'll increase this a little bit. Is that, how's it look for you guys back there? It's fine. It's fine? It's good enough? Okay. Too short. Um, so, I came up with these demos a little bit quickly, so I hope, I hope they help. Um, this is one, uh, this just shows various nuances between all, basically all of the stuff that we were talking about. Um, so this is a basic component right here. My index.html has really nothing in it. It just pulls in React and then pulls in my app.js. Um, so here I'm creating a clicker component um, with a React create class. Um, and then I have my render function, which renders an anchor that has an onclick event listener and an href, which is just a void thing. Um, and contents that say, I click this amount of times, and the, the actual number is going to be the count from my state. Um, so here, you're, you're seeing that, um, and then I render the component into the document body by just creating it, just by, call, just by calling the clicker. You don't have to say do. Um, so by default, I'm not passing anything in. Um, and so what I'm using here is a count variable, which is on my state. Um, so in React, there's a method called get initial state, which will get the initial state for your app. So, so this, is, this is a component local state. This is what we were talking about. This, I'm not really going to show you much of the global state because you, you can do that, but you, um, that's, it's a little easier to learn this way and then kind of learn how to, how to combine things a little bit better. Um, and it's, it's okay to have component local state if that's really what you should be doing. So get initial state uh, returns a count of zero. Um, and then you'll see I pass the method handle click into the on click handler of the anchor. And then in the handle click method, I call set state, which is what changes the state of the, of the component. And then I pass in a, 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 a JavaScript hash of what change. So I'm saying change the count to my current state of count plus one. So what should happen when I when I click? Anybody? Yeah, it it will increase the count. Um, so that shows you kind of how it calls back into React. Um, when, when I call set state, by default, that's what React uses to notify itself that something has changed. So, so when I call this set, set state, at the end of the handle click is when it will re-render everything and just realize that the A has changed. So that's a pretty trivial example. Does anybody have any questions about that specifically? So are there any scenarios when you might just uh, update this.state.count without calling set state? Um, yes, but that's pretty rare. Um, it's actually getting into the more like if you want to control your own state, um, which that's there's a demo I'll do in a, in a little bit about that too. But no, like you should use set state. Most people just use set state. And, and when you call set state, you, you only need to pass in the things that are changing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So 
on your second line, you have bar down to react that down. Is that something you need, or is that just sort of boilerplate? That's just, that's just a boilerplate thing. Um, that enables me to do dom.a instead of do this. It's just <coughs> a boilerplate. Right. Yeah, that's that's the only difference. That's that's how I like to do that. So set state's only subject. It's not the entire thing. So when you do a set state there, you literally can just add like whatever change is not the entire. Yeah, exactly. If I had, if I had, um, you know, timestamp here, um, then it would just change count. Yeah, because it could be change state or something when it gets set set a little bit here. Uh, so I have five demos, so there's plenty of time to ask questions. Uh, uh, let's see. So this one um, shows you how inputs work, um, and I'm also going to show you how. Um, uh, uh, Composition works. Um, so this demo, I'll just go ahead and show it to you. Uh, sorry, I was going to just change it. Um, in this demo, I create. Um, I'm using this bar app, so I create an app component, and that's kind of typical. Um, and so in this app component, my initial state is a list of names and a filter, which is null, um, and then a handle filter method, which I'll get to you soon. So what this renders is a, a div that has an input and a UL. Um, and the input, um, when it's changed, is bound to the handle filter function. And the value initially is, um, or the value that is, is the input is the filter in my current state. Um, and the UL, um, so here, here you can start seeing the power of just JavaScript, using JavaScript to, to generate markup, or DOM. Um, so I, I call a reduce method on names, which lets me iterate over names and um, build up a new list according to whatever I want to do. So I basically say, either there is not a filter, or the item on the lower, or the lower case of the current item, if there's, um, if the filter exists in this uh, item name, um, then I'm going to render it. So I push it to my array, um, which I basically, right here you're seeing that I create an LI element. Um, so I'm dynamically constructing this DOM, and that is returned in this whole reduce call and as children of the UL element. So here, uh, basically, I basically say either there's not a filter or it matches the filter. I'm going to render this item, and on the input, um, the only thing left is the handle filter function. So when the input changes, I call set state on the filter on the filter property of my state. So, Where is the um, they're just rendered as a children of the UL, so they're just going to be right, right below the input. So, good question, Jay. Um, this is, there's, you know, the DOM here, the virtual DOM that you're working with, what's the correlation with the actual DOM? It's just starting from um, the body element you get to render it within the body, but can you, like, I guess I'm thinking about, can you work with parts of an existing page here and just say, kind of like the way they need to control it for it, but I don't really want to introduce React at this part of this larger page, and that's from the position which the DOM, the virtual DOM is out there. Yeah, um, that's, where, that's where render component comes in. So right now I'm running it to document the body. You could say document that query selector, you know, my, my, little, um, my little list thing, and it would render to list thing. And you could have like you could you, you could have multiple React render components, and each one knows what it's managing and what it's mounted into. <laughs> so it's yeah pretty easy to um, control where it goes. So what this does is I have this list of names, then I have this input, and as I type, it's dynamically filtering. You know, if I type ma, it's everything that has me or ma or just n. So whatever it contains my filter, um, it's dynamically updating. This li, because whenever I call, whenever the the whenever I type into the filter, the input changes, which calls handle filter, which sets the state of my filter, which triggers a re-render of the whole thing. Um, and in this whole thing, this reduce call is now only matching items that match my filter. Um, so the the trick here is that if I um, if I actually remove on change and I pass a value to input. Um, uh, let's see, that's actually null. Um, so it's actually null, but if you pass an initial value to an input, um, I'm actually typing right now, and it won't change it for me. 
And that's happening because I don't have an on change event on my input um, because the when I as I type, um, I'm trying to think of the best way to express this, it's basically only rendering the input with this value. And as I type, I don't have an on change handler to change my state. Um, so it requires you to have an on change handler um, to actually make it work. Now there's a I think there's a default value if, if I said to default value. This, this would uh, make what's called an unbound element, which just means I can just change anything. But you, um, because of the way like this works, you always want your app state to contain the input of the value so that you can do stuff with it. It's, a, it's part of your app. You shouldn't have this random, val random text in an input somewhere that you have to query the input and get back. It should be part of your raw app state. Um, so that was supposed to kind of, does that make sense to everybody? Is there any questions? Sure. Uh, what, I'm not quite getting the bind to call there at the end of the UL. Oh, that's just a that's just a JavaScript thing where um, I have to bind this to this map call because I use uh, uh, let's see. I actually don't use this, but see. Um, so yeah, if if I use this in this function, um, the JavaScript this is dynamically rebound for each function call. So the this in here would not be the this the component, so I have to bind. Just bind just takes uh, it binds it recreates the function and makes sure that it uh, the context of this is the this that you pass to bind. And then as far as the li is being generated, since you're inside a ul, I guess it just assumes that it should make li instead of whatever thing you throw at it. You got dom dot li. No, see, I I've, I've got the dom dot dot li right here. Oh, oh. yeah. What is that? Okay. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I can make completely invalid markup if I wanted to. Uh, okay, so you're still doing the same kind of thing where you're just returning an array of, of mm -hmm. dominant allies. Yep, got it. Exactly. It's all, it's all is just, uh, they're all JavaScript objects that you can manage and manipulate however you want to. Um, and what's what's really cool about all of this, about why it's, it's all in JavaScript, is like, um, I'll get into this more later, I think, but this, um, this handle filter function could totally just be a normal JavaScript function up here. And then uh, in here, I actually just call handle filter. Um, so it's just really neat because React allows you to refactor your app in ways that are completely impossible in other places because it's such a <coughs> such a, a focused and minimal library. Um, so you could actually just have a bunch of raw JavaScript functions inside some kind of closure, and then at the bottom just return some kind of component that closes over them if you wanted to do it that way. So, uh, can you, can you scroll into where you're actually using that app that you're creating? Um, I just call app. I just create it down here, uh -huh. and then I render it into the body. Okay. So, how does the if I wanted to pass in an initial state, how how would I go about that? You would you would pass it in as a property. That's a good question. I'm the app right here. It's it's a component that's exactly like the DOM that did. So I could pass you know, um, I could pass an initial state right here. It's a property, and then with an app, I wouldn't need this anymore, and um, and I would call, I would call this dot props instead of this dot state, and I'm actually going to explain that in the next demo. Um, so, but all of the properties that are available <coughs> as properties, properties are meant to be immutable things that I'm just rendering and that I'm reacting to. I'm not supposed to change anything. In properties state is supposed to represent my local state. It's a very very big difference. So obviously, kind of the stuff you're writing here lends itself to being single page apps. You know, what you're building. Does it have anything outside of just handling of the view, like handling routing? Or stuff or no? Nope, it's just totally views. just views, okay. which makes it. You know, the the Ember folk have their strong argument is that they want the framework to be opinionated, and that so you work on large teams, and that the opinions are already there, and you just have to ask it what the best thing is to do, and it'll tell you. Uh, this is kind of an opposite opinion of that where uh, it's easier to integrate in existing apps. It's a lot more. I, I love the fact that I can go to React right here. Like this is what blew me away when I was first re researching this. Like I just look at this like initial JS fiddle. You're used to seeing Angular and Ember being like not bad, but like it's like two lines of it's like three three or four lines of code, right? Um, so it, it completely like you you could take uh, Ember's routing library, I think, and just use that. People have if, um, people have integrated this with Backbone, actually use Backbone's models. Um, and then wherever somebody 
I'm not sure how it works, but they basically use a lot of backbone, but then they use React for the actual rendering, so they, they don't have to do the render part. Do you know of other big applications that are using this? Facebook and Instagram. <laughs> the, 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 yeah. 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 Um, Airbnb uses it. Yeah. Oh, Airbnb. Airbnb does a lot. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that it was set back a little bit because of the initial presentation last May. Uh, which got a negative response. Um, I think they've built up a lot of credibility since then, but I think we're going to start seeing a lot more. I think I personally think that this is like Ember and Angular have been really great, and they're going to be around for a long time. But I think that the movement towards JavaScript will be more stuff like this because it's still declarative, but it's still it just works. But this is the, well, the what what I like about it. This is simple. This is taking you back to the well. This is taking you back back to the server side rendering days, right? Mm -hmm. You, you always run it from the server side, you read under the page again, so yeah. you, think, oh, yeah. you, think, you can think like that now and yep. things get simple. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you were <coughs> more of a 